Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this presentation by the Arizona Center for Civic Leadership at the Flynn Foundation. Our topic this afternoon is Luck of the Draw, a major expansion of gaming in the state of Arizona. My name is Kirk Adams. I'm the former chief of staff to Governor Doug Ducey. We have a distinguished panel here this afternoon that I would like to introduce to you. First, I'd like to introduce Governor Lewis of the Gila River Indian community. Thank you, Governor Lewis, for joining us. Also joining us, joining us is Senator Rebecca Rios, Minority Leader in the Arizona State Senate. Rebecca, good to have you here with us. We also have with us Representative Jeff Winnegar, Chairman of the House Commerce Committee and sponsor of House Bill 2772, the sports betting portion of this package. Jeff, great to have you with us. Also joining us is Amy Lynn Pierce of the Arizona Diamondbacks, Vice President of Government Affairs. Thank you, Amy, good to have you with us. And finally, I'd like to introduce Annie Foster, General Counsel to Governor Doug Ducey and a key architect of this gaming compact and sports betting legislation. And that's where we are going to begin. For the first time in two decades, Arizona leaders came together and produced in a bipartisan fashion, a historic achievement in the expansion of tribal gaming across Arizona and the establishment of legalized sports betting. Now that sounds a lot easier said than done. And so today we're going to dig into it just a little bit. We're gonna start first with Annie Foster, who will be giving us a detailed presentation of what's in the compact, what it's all about. And by the way, how do we even get here? So start with a little bit of history to put it all in context for you. After that, we're gonna have a panel discussion about how this happened, how the deals were made, what it was like, maybe some of the drama uh, that occurred along the way. And then we'll finish with enough time for Q&A from the audience. So right now I wanna turn the time over to Annie to kick it off and share with us a little bit about just what is in this compact and how do we get here. Annie? Thank you, Kirk. Um, so let me just pull up my um, screen here. And um, I've got a PowerPoint for you all and um, gonna cover a lot of ground um, in 15 minutes um, that I've been allotted to kind of go through this. So um, it, it's a lot of information, um, but this PowerPoint can be available. Um, if you guys just wanna contact uh, the Flynn Foundation, we'll make sure that you get it um, if you desire it. So um, an overview of tribal gaming in Arizona. Uh, I'm just gonna go through um, the history of Indian gaming in Arizona. Um, what happened in the compacts prior to the amendment that everybody's aware of that happened this year, and then what the amendment and changes in 2021 did and modernization of gaming here in Arizona. So I want to go all the way back to the beginning, and I will tell you, uh, I'm originally from the East Coast, and when I um, went to law school and moved out West, um, uh, tribal law issues fascinated me, and I took a tribal law class in, in law school, and interestingly enough, I remember hearing about this case where um, there were um, FBI agents that were raiding um, a, a tribal community um, in Arizona, there were guns drawn, it it was very dramatic. Um, lo and behold, um, you know, 16 years later, I am now um, part of that story in, in some senses because um, uh, that case involved a, a raid um, for some Indian casinos here in Arizona. Um, what had happened um, back in the early 90s is, um, and Governor Lewis can talk about this more when um, he gets the opportunity, but gaming is a culture um, uh, amongst Native Americans. And, and it's part of some of their cultures. Um, and from a federal perspective, there were a lot of states that wanted to sort of take on uh, gaming issues. And they decided the federal government came in and said, you know what, we need to regulate this because it is something that's cultural with Native Americans. And we want to make sure that they have that opportunity to um, use this as a revenue generator for um, their nations. So there was federal law that was passed um, to, to regulate this. 
But what the federal law said is that tribal nations would only have the right um, to game if there was state statute that allowed for it within the state they were located. Um, so back in the 90s, um, that law was passed by the federal government the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, and then subsequently there were regulations that were done. But like I said, Arizona didn't have a law that allowed for it. And so what ended up happening is we did have this raid um, that Governor Symington actually went out to, I believe it was Fort McDowell. There were news stories, that's what you see there um, in the New York Times, the Washington Post about what was going on on this issue. Um, and so from a historical context, the state of Arizona, you know, had moral reservations about gaming and allowing gaming to happen. So from a political side, that that was a factor. Um, I already mentioned the, the tribal culture and, and how gaming plays into that. Um, and, and then the establishment of the Indian Re Gaming Regulatory Act all sort of came together to create a perfect storm where Arizona became the forefront of this issue in terms of allowing um, gaming to occur on, on reservations. And, and, you know, just like any other political issue, there were, you know, strong opinions on both sides. But what ended up happening is um, Governor Symington, after a 10 day, um, you know, cooling off period after this standoff, um, he and the legislature came together to um, work to resolve the problem. And the result was the passage of ARS 5-601, which was signed on July uh, 1st of 1992 and went into effect immediately. And obviously um, you can't have an emergency clause without having some bipartisan um, agreement on that. So um, there, there was a lot that went into that. Um, I wasn't here at the time. I'm sure there were others that were and, and might be able to speak to it. Um, but it, it established the ability of the governor to enter into compacts with the tribal nations here in Arizona um, and you know pursue tribal gaming, but kept gaming on the reservation there was no off-reservation um, gaming that was allowed. That led into additional compacts with 16 of um, the 23 tribes at the time. I think there, there have been some tribes that have lost federal recognition, and that's why we're at 22. Um, and then ultimately that statute was amended multiple times um, to add um, you know, different negotiating topics um, and limit the governor's authority a bit um, and the establishment of the Department of Gaming in order to um, regulate gaming on the tribal reservations. Um, in 1996, then we had Proposition 201. So what comes into, uh, into play here is not just the governor and the legislature, but there have been several times where this issue has been taken to the voters, and, and 1996 was sort of the first one um, that, again, kind of... Uh, gave some regulation into exactly how um, the compacts could work, what was allowed on uh, tribal reservations. And then there became some litigation um, under Governor Hall about what the authority of the governor was and what was gonna happen. Um, and then we come into play, which is some of the issues that happened at the legislature this year, is the racing industry started to question, well, wait a minute, we wanna have part of this gaming act Activity be part of what our industry is part of. And, and so you saw them getting involved in this um, discussion. So that leads us to the early 2000s and what was the precursor to um, the amendment that we entered this year. Um, so we had the American Greyhound Racing case. And in that case, what ended up happening was there were questions about the governor's authority, what she could actually agree to under the compacts. And uh, ultimately, the courts decided it, it went all the way to the Ninth Circuit. The courts decided that the governor did have the legal authority to enter into compacts, but there was some law that led to the need to change 
um, Arizona statute because there was a question of delegation of authority between the legislature and the governor. And the court sort of indicated that the, the statute didn't properly delegate um, the authority. And so before that got appealed, there was an initiative process that got started. Um, and in 2002, there were actually three propositions on the ballot that were put forth towards the um, towards the voters um, to weigh in. The first was Prop 200. Um, this was about the tribal state gaming compacts and really directed uh, where the money was going to go to. Um, that failed ultimately. The second proposition was Prop 201, and this was called the Fair Gaming Act. And this actually allowed for um, the, the racing industry to be involved and they were going to have um, tribe or tri have gaming um, within the racing facilities. Um, and that ultimately failed as well. What we know as the compact um, sort of the construction of the compact was Prop 202, which did pass in 2002. Um, and that really um, addressed the legal roadblocks that were um, brought up in all of the litigation that occurred, as well as creating a framework uh, for what the, the governor, uh, Governor Hall at the time had negotiated um, to move forward and, and kind of lay out exactly what the compact could entail and what the authority of the governor was. Um, so between 2002 and 2021, um, that framework was what the compacts were. Uh, there, there is some language difference between what's in actual statute. It's codified under 5601.01. Um, and so um, those compacts have remained in existence. Um, 22 tribes signed on. There was a term of 20 years. And those compacts were going to begin expiring in 2023. Um, but the big thing that the tribes were interested in is that, you know, the compacts provided exclusivity for gambling on tribal reservations only. So that's why here in Arizona, if you don't know, you don't see casinos, you know, just in downtown Phoenix, they're all limited to the reservations. Um, and, and that's what the compacts provided for. Now, some people might say, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm, I'm aware that, um, you know, we do a casino night, you know, as a, as a fundraiser of things. There are some exceptions for charitable um, organizations to have casino nights. Um, but they're they're very limited as to how those things can happen. Bingo is another exception. Um, but every time that um, the issue of anything touching gaming has come to the legislature in the past, um, you know, number of years, the reason why it hasn't moved forward is because of the compacts. And I'll get into that detail a little bit more. So the, what was included in the 2022 compacts before it was amended, I want to take a minute and just sort of explain. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about rural tribes, non-gaming tribes, metro tribes. What does that mean? I sort of laid it out here in this slide so you can see it. The big difference is between you know, gaming and non-gaming tribes. So the, the tribes that are listed as rural gaming tribes and metro tribes are called gaming tribes. Those tribes all have casinos um, on their reservations and are operating gaming. Non-gaming tribes, they do have the right to operate gaming facilities, but they've basically sort of for, foregone that right. And, you know, they... Uh, have transferred their rights to some of the other tribes. And they do that through transfer agreements between the tribes. The state's not a party to those agreements where they transfer devices, think slot machines um, to another tribe to operate. So if you are the um, Havasupai tribe at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, right? Um, building a casino, um, you're probably not gonna get much out of that. It's not really logistically possible. 
but they can take their device allocations and transfer them to another tribe, say in the Metro Phoenix area, and then they can generate revenue um, through that. So it, it's a way for the um, rural tribes that don't have really the opportunity to operate a casino to, to benefit from the compacts. So prior to amendment, as I mentioned, we had 22 tribes. They all have the exact same com compact. Although I will tell you in 2009, there was a, a small amendment that not all the tribes signed on to, but it, logistically they're, they're pretty much the same. Um, there was limited gaming, limited number of casinos, limited number of devices and limited table games. You know, they, they couldn't do um, Baccarat, they couldn't do um, roulette and crap, some of the things that you might have seen in Vegas, people would question, well, why don't we have that here in Arizona? Um, it was because it wasn't allowed under the compact. And as I mentioned, under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, if it's not allowed under state law, um, then it's not allowed um, on the reservation. Um, it also addressed class two gaming. Class two gaming is something that under the Ingl Indian Regulatory Act um, is reserved for the tribes that um, isn't part of the compact. They're, they're allowed to um, operate class two gaming, class two gaming, and, and I'm gonna really simplify it here. Um, it's more, um, it, it's different than class three gaming is more like the slot machines where it's really a, a, a game of chance and it's based on, you know, a, an algorithm. Um, class two gaming is more along the lines of bingo. So, you know, you might have a slot machine that um, it, the way it operates is more like a bingo game rather than an algorithm like class three gaming. Um, and for any of you that might have followed the the litigation in regards to the West Valley Casino that's operated by the Tohono O'odham Nation. This was an issue that um, came up where they were operating class two um, machines um, rather than class three gaming. They have switched over, but um, that became an issue in that litigation. Um, furthermore, under the, the compacts prior to amendment, there was no off reservation gaming except for lottery, horse racing and betting um, and bingo and share events as I previously mentioned. Um, the revenue share under the prior uh, agreement, prior compacts, um, benefited the Arizona Benefits Fund. So it, be, it was dependent on how much revenue the tribe was generating as to how much they were um, having a revenue share with the state. And the Arizona Benefits Fund uh, um, funded several other funds. The Instructional Improvement Fund, that's a, an education fund, the Arizona Wildlife Conservation Fund, Trauma and Emergency Services Fund, Commerce and Econ Economic Development Commission, the Tourism Fund, and then there was a portion of the revenue share that would go to local governments, and those distributions are at the discretion of the tribes. Um, they're not prescribed specifically for specific things. Um, there's also monies that would go to the Department of Gaming um, for regulation of gaming and um, some funding that also goes to problem gambling to make sure that the Department of Gaming, you know, is is getting the message out and has resources to address problem gambling um, concerns. The other big thing that a lot of people have heard about is the poison pill, and and people don't understand what the poison pill is. You know, it, 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 they don't necessarily understand um, how that plays in. Um, so the poison pill is is a portion of the compact and, and it basically says that if the state enacts any law um, that takes away gaming rights or allows for gaming off reservation, then this poison pill comes into play. And what that means is there's um, gonna be a decrease in the revenue share to the state. Um, and so the state would lose revenue and um, other provisions of the agreement need to be the same. So if uh, the state enters an agreement with one tribe and not with another, then those provisions um, uh, are become mutual even without a signing of an additional amendment. Um, it also removes the limits to the number of devices and the number of casinos that are available. Um, so that poison pill is really important. And again, why 
anytime legislation would come forward, um, everyone would say, well, this is going to be a poison pill violation and um, that legislation wouldn't move forward. Um, so the compacts were due to expire in 2023. Um, and um, Kirk was, you know, at the beginning of this, I came in partway through, but um, negotiation went on for over five years. And uh, with that, the state had three goals um, to modernize the compacts to keep the current culture and to increase revenue to the state. Um, that those goals were among a, a backdrop of you know, back in 2002, during the last um, compact um, where it was enacted, um, since that time, there was a major expansion to the state's population. Um, sports betting became legal after the Supreme Court decision in the NCAA uh, case. And just an overall changing attitude towards gambling. I mentioned before sort of the moral reservations that the state had um, against gambling. Um, some of those have changed over time. So we had to take all of that into account. Um, under for fiscal year 2020, I, I just wanted to highlight that um, what we were looking at in terms of money for the Arizona Benefits Fund is over $102 million was distributed to the Arizona Benefits Fund um, based on um, gaming under the prior compact. Obviously, we wanted to see that increase going forward. And so that was part of the goal of the state. Um, and then you can see for cities, towns, and counties, um, the aggregate amount is about 13 million, $14 million for fiscal year 2020. We don't have the final tally for uh, fiscal year 2021 yet. So what were the changes in um, 2021? So far, we have 20 tribes that have signed um, the compact amendment, and it has been approved by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is um, a precursor to the effectiveness of any um, compact or amendment. We do have two tribes that have not signed. Um, one, of, uh, one of those tribes has recently notified the state that it's, it's um, it, sort of um, calling into question the poison pill and we're in the process of, of going through that. Um, again, they haven't signed the compact amendment, but um, we're working through that and, and think that'll be resolved. And another tribe has um, been looking at the amendment, but has not made any decisions yet on signing. Um, so the compact amendment contains provisions for on-reservation gaming, much like I've talked before. Um, but it, the big change and why everybody's interested in this is that it also addressed the 2021 Gaming Act, which made its way through the legislature this year. And that Gaming Act provides for limited off-reservation gaming, um, and it has to be referenced in the compact in order to make sure that um, we are, you know, not violating some of the agreements that we previously had with the tribes. Um, the compact amendment also provided a change to revenue share, and it basically put it in line with what's sort of already happening. I mentioned before, there's the range of one to eight percent. But what we found is there was only a small number of tribes who were actually making that higher percentage uh, revenue share payment. Um, some of the other tribes, um, just because of where they're located, were making less. And so um, it kind of just distributed it um, according to uh, the what we were seeing rather than just have the range. Um, and finally, um, well, not finally, but another provision was the additional table games I mentioned before, you know, roulette and craps weren't allowed um, on at tribal casinos, they are now. And um, so I, I've seen some news stories recently where, um, you know, that's, that's up and running on, on some, uh, in some casinos, and um, I think people are getting excited about it. It also allowed for event wagering and fantasy sports betting, which I'll get into in just a minute. Um, the compacts after amendment also addressed um, the location of new casinos, increases in the number of devices that were allowed, um, and a duration of 20 years, but also a definition of the Phoenix metro area because there were concerns um, that um, too many casinos were getting built in the Phoenix metro area, so it provides limits on that. 
Um, here's just some benefits um, to the state, to the tribes, joint benefits. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, obviously those were all things that we needed to address. Um, and then finally, the provisions that everybody is really interested in is sports betting. It allows for off-reservation um, sports betting. We call it event wagering here in Arizona through licenses of um, professional sporting teams. Um, tribes can also obtain licenses for off-reservation mobile sports betting, and this is a big deal um, for them to be able to capture uh, some revenue um, off-reservation as well, but they do have to go through that licensing process. There's a total of 20 licenses, and then there's an additional 10 limiting event wagering licenses for off-track betting locations and racetracks. Um, and again, on-reservation tribes can um, still do all of this on reservation without state regulation, um, except under the compacts. Fantasy sports is also now legal um, and will be allowed off reservation. Um, there is a provision for you know, any kind of contest. If, if you're just doing something with your friends in your basement and the awards are less than $10,000, you can still do that. You're not gonna violate the law, but anything over that, um, you will need to be regulated through the Department of Gaming. Um, and then finally, Kino that was run by the lottery is going to be allowed or is now legal. Um, lottery is working on getting that up and running, but it's limited as to where that can happen. Um, tracks, OTBs, fraternal organizations, and all the revenue for all three of those things go to the general fund. Um, and so the legislature has a little more say going forward, um, or a lot more say as to where those funds actually gone. So I know that's a lot of information but I'm going to turn it back over to Kirk and the panel um, to move forward. Thank you, Annie. That was a, a lot of information, but really just scratching the surface of the details of this um, compact and legislation. So thank you for that excellent presentation. And to our um, audience members, feel free at any time, um, if you have questions, to post that question in the Q&A section and we'll be sure to get to it uh, later on. So for our panelists now, we wanna start a discussion. And what I want to do first is begin with the end. And I wanna go back to earlier this spring at the Heard Museum, when tribal leaders and state leaders gathered together for the formal signing of the compact and House Bill 2772 that legalized event wagering, sports betting here in the state of Arizona. And I want to start with Governor Lewis. Governor Lewis, you have been a leader amongst the tribal nations for a long time, uh, preceded in that role by your father. Um, this was a big day. I want to know um, how you felt on that day having achieved this accomplishment. And then I have a second follow-up question for you. Governor? No, thank you. Uh... Kirk, and, and uh, it's great to see my fellow panelists where I, I, I genuinely think we made history. Uh, thank you. We had, uh, especially uh, with, with the, the, the amendment that went through the state legislature, I know that we, uh, Miss uh, Annie Foster uh, and, um, and the, 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 the great Senator Rios as well, we spent a lot of time, I think, on, on meetings, um, really, you know, behind the scenes. Um, and, and getting this done. And, um, and, and also, um, I think, I think Ms. Foster laid out just a tremendous history of where we're at in regards to uh, Arizona Indian gaming, a true evolution of a relationship between tribes among themselves and, and the tribes with the state of Arizona. I'm very, very proud. And, I, and thank you again, Kirk. My father, the late Rod Lewis, who was uh, the first attorney uh, for our community. Uh, you know, he helped to negotiate our first compact with the state of Arizona. And now as governor, I was at the negotiating table. So this is really, you know, and, and we, we think of, of, of gaming in a short um, a period of time as it evolved. But really, as you can see, just as, as was scratched, scratching the surface of history, you know, you're, you're seeing now, uh, you know, the next chapter. There are chapters being written here in Arizona uh, and the gaming compacts between the tribes and Arizona, I'm proud to say, are 
probably the most innovative uh, a balance of interests among all gaming compacts across the United States. And we set the model, an important model here in Arizona. I want to thank you also, uh, uh, Kirk, uh, you know, for, for, for your leadership, both within, within the governor's office. When we, what was it, uh, uh, Kirk, five years ago, we started. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. I remember we had all the tribal leaders uh, at the state capitol. And, you know, there was a lot of, uh, of, of, of issues having to do with, with trust. Uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, and, and I think it's important, especially for, for the Flynn Institute, you know, in regards to public policy, uh, it has to be reflective uh, and inclusive of Arizona is such a unique, beautiful state. And tribal nations uh, are a significant impact of not only the history and culture of Arizona, but also uh, of the economic engine of Arizona. And you know, we are proud, and as a, the tribal leader of the Gila River Indian community, we're proud to be also a tremendous partner in the state of Arizona for the, for the future of the state of Arizona as well. And these compacts uh, the, 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 and, and the amendments are, are crucial to that. And what I said, Kirk, uh, you know, before, before I get off my soapbox, I said there at the Heard Museum at the signing, and there's an old saying uh, that goes something like this, just because we did it, doesn't mean it wasn't impossible. It wasn't impossible when we set out, and that was truly the case. Uh, you know, we had Republicans and Democrats. Uh, we had, uh, of course, different tribes as well, and and even among even among the tribes, as 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 Miss Foster pointed out, you know, you had tribes that represented rural interests, that represented urban interests. Uh, you know, making sure that we grew our compacts, that we grew gaming in a responsible fashion, as we are caretakers to our, our natural resources, to our land, to our water, uh, our economic development. That's so important to us uh, in diversifying our economy, but also complementing the state of Arizona as well. We want to make sure, and we wanted to make sure, and that these new compacts uh, that we grew, we grew our market responsibly. And I think we Really, we, we really came across in, in one of the, you know, and, and I'll throw out another term, sort of a unicorn, where all interests, all interests uh, were respected. Uh, and, and it was a true win for, 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 for everyone. Um, and, and, you know, and we can, we can kind of delve more, more into this, but, um, you know, th there was definitely a push and pull. And, 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 and of course, I think for, for all, all the viewers, you know, it's important that, uh, that compromise was, was also a part of that among all parties, not just one party compromised. Everyone compromised to move these discussions forward. Uh, and I think that's very important, uh, you know, to, to discuss when we look at really, you know, because we, we see as tribes, as sovereign nations, you know, we see this as a very important relationship that we have with the state of Arizona. Um, and, and, and in regards to, uh, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, of course, who was the father of that? Uh, our own Senator, Senator John McCain. So Arizona really is uh, the history and the model for Indian gaming. Uh, so I, I, if I can lead off there, you know, I think, you know, having everyone there at the Heard Museum, truly, uh, that was a, a, his, a historic marker, not only for tribes, but also for, for the state of Arizona, as we are all, we are all state citizens as well. Thank you, Governor. Um, thank you for your comments. And I think every one of the panelists here and everybody involved with this recognizes that without your bold leadership, we wouldn't ever have gotten there. And so we very much appreciate the leadership that you showed. Kirk, Kirk, if I, Kirk, go and, down, and, and, and if I can say too, because I kind of, yeah. I, I, I sort of sometimes I, you know, I, I kind of get on my soapbox, but we could not have done this without Governor Ducey as well. He was wanting to move and to negotiate with tribes when no one in the state of Arizona wanted to. You know, we were coming up on, on just a few years before our compacts would expire. And so, you know, and, and with tribes, tribal governmental gaming, you know, we represent not only, you know, we give back to Arizona in so many different ways. Um, you know, we are an important part of the economy, but also, you know, we, we the, the, the negotiations started before the pandemic, during the pandemic, but 
you know, uh, tribes, we're going to be an important part of this recovery process. Governor Ducey, he was a visionary. Governor Ducey, our, our, our governor of Arizona, had the vision uh, and had really, I, I would say, the political acumen and the courage to engage with tribes and to start this process. So uh, we, 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 of course, we, we could not have done this with, without uh, Governor Ducey's leadership and, and as was said, and modernizing the gaming compacts. Wonderful, thank you. And, and I, can, I can vouch for the governor's role in this as his chief of staff at the time. He constantly um, had our back at the negotiating table and was encouraging and working with tribal leaders directly and allowing us the time and bandwidth we needed to get this done. But Rebecca, Senator Rios, I wanna to go to you next. Um, again, let's go back to this spring to the Heard Museum. Um, you played a key role, uh, not only in uh, the state Senate, but with your Democrat caucus in both houses in bringing support onto this measure. And, and I want to ask you the same question I asked Governor Lewis. You're at the Heard Museum this spring. What did that feel like to be part of this historic effort? You know, it felt incredible to be a part of that effort. It, it's to be a small piece of history because clearly it was history in the making. But I was also standing there recognizing and, and looking back over what it kind of took in, in my small part to get there. And just to kind of set the stage with, you know, everybody who's watching. Historically, you know, Democrats have worked for and on behalf of Indian communities and are always there supporting Indian communities. So when the issue of Indian gaming came up, being the minority leader in the Senate, my initial reaction was, oh, slam dunk, we're, we're all gonna be supportive because how could we not be? Um, only to find out very quickly that um, I had a sizable number of members in my Democratic caucus that had concerns and that were not necessarily willing to support the bill. And Again, coming from a, a place where we had always supported these issues, it was, it was as um, foreign as Democrats not supporting public education. So um, I really have to you know, e extend a, a warm thank you to Governor Lewis and other um, tribal leaders, because at the end of the day, I had members that were not willing to listen to lobbyists, right? They did not want right. to hear from lobbyists. They wanted to hear directly from tribes and were it not for a real collaboration between tribal leaders, um, Annie being ready at the governor's office for every single member that wanted to sit there for hours on end and go through compacts, this would have never come to fruition. So it was a unique process um, specifically for me because of, of the history with Democrats and Native Americans. And, and let me just throw in there as Governor Lewis was talking about kind of following in his father's footsteps, I have to add that in 1992, my father was president of the Senate during um, that initial negotiation with gaming compacts. My father worked um, with Governor Lewis's father and I grew up hearing stories about um, Clinton Patea, who was the leader of Fort McDowell and how the local community literally took up arms um, to essentially block these moving trucks from leaving with their gaming machines. And I love the part of the story where my dad relayed, you know, I don't know if it was irony or just to add insult to injury, but the moving trucks were Mayflower moving trucks, you know, and it's all of those stories and images that, you know, I just kind of held with me as we were going through this whole process. Um, again, but the ultimate goal of we've got to get there. This is not only good for um, you know, our, our Native American communities, it's good for all of Arizona, but it was a very eventful process. <laughs> Great, thank you, Senator. And um, I had the honor of serving with your dad briefly before he left the state legislature and um, know that he did many great things for the state. And it is poetic that all these years later, you also get to work, the work that you did on a new gaming compact. Um, so thank you for your efforts. We know that without your leadership, you wouldn't be here either. Now, sponsoring any bill is tough work but sponsoring a bill of this political import, of this complexity is a lot of work. And Representative Jeff Winnegar, chair of the House Commerce Committee, um, when I found out um, that he had agreed to sponsor the legislation, I'll admit I did a little bit of a happy dance because I knew that we had drawn a sponsor 
um, that was really going to put his shoulder into this. So, Representative Winnegar, let's take you back to the Herd Museum this spring at the signing of this legislation. Something that you have been interested in and worked on and wanted to do something about for as long as I can remember you being in the legislature. You finally got it done. What was that like for you? Thanks. Thanks for having me. It, it was an amazing feeling and it was a whole wide array of things that went into that. I mean, one was the teamwork and the bipartisanship and the uh, uh, working with the tribal nations, working with the teams, working with Democrats and Republicans and seeing that all come together. I know I haven't been involved there as long as others' families, but it felt like 30 years in those uh, three months, <laughs> I can tell you that. Everybody who thought this was easy uh, uh, didn't really understand what was going on because we passed it out of the house and it seemed like an eternity to get to that, but on March 4th, and then it was a full five or five and a half weeks later before um, we got it out of the Senate. So it, it was very long, but so it was very gracious to see everybody come together and, and such a team effort. I mean, it, it wasn't one person or this person. I mean, everybody works so well together. Um, and then just coming from a person who, you know, admittedly, I, I understand gaming. I understand playing at a poker table. I understand blackjack. And, and so I, um, at least on this view, I can see things on an economic development standpoint that is going to be very, very beneficial. And I think it even gets into the smaller things that, that Annie and the governor and them worked on in the compact as well. I mean, to me, raising the limits, I have friends who are professional poker players have been telling me for a long time, if you raise the limits, then you can have bigger tournaments with bigger players that come in town because when they get knocked out, they want to get into a big side game at the poker table. And so I think when you talk about that, when you talk about just being higher on the list of economic development for conferences and different things, I, I think the the downstream economic development and sales taxes that are going to come in aren't you know, the multipliers aren't even figured into this. And so uh, being a, a commerce and an economic development geek, I'm really uh, excited about that aspect. And I can tell you a couple of the interviews I did on radio, uh, one of the comments, Jody said, you know, this is an, a, an every person bill. This is kind of even bringing together people who, who aren't necessarily into politics and don't pay attention. And maybe a lot of people in politics don't pay attention to sports, but it's kind of bringing those together because uh, a lot of people who had never even thought about uh, politics at all were tuning in and listening to see where this bill was because a lot of our everyday citizens want to bet on a, on a football game, want to bet on a, on a baseball game. And so I think it, it was uh, an important aspect in that as well. But it was it was very gratifying and I just felt humbled to be amongst uh, so many people who work so hard to get it done over a very, very long time. Thank you, Representative, and for your leadership on this. So now I want to go to Amy Lynn Pierce, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, you know, sports betting, um, it's come to Arizona. Um, it immediately affects um, our professional uh, sports teams. Um, you also were part of this effort um, to get this through um, the legislature. Um, for those that aren't, uh, aren't familiar with how this had to work, the gaming compact was not something that had to go through the legislature itself. It was something that was negotiated with between the tribes and the state of Arizona with the governor, um, the executive branch having the authority to do that. But the sports bay legislation, which we call event wagering, was tied or in legislative terms triggered to the gaming compact, meaning you couldn't have sports betting without also the gaming compact and vice versa. So let's take you back this spring to the Herd Museum with everybody there in the room and the signing of the of House Bill 2772, legalizing sports betting. What did that mean not only to the Arizona Diamondbacks, but for, but for professional sports generally in Arizona? Um, it was really exciting to be a part of it, absolutely, because like everybody has said, it was historic. Um, but for us specifically, 
it, I mean, at the, the very base level means a new stream of revenue for us coming off of a, a rough year. Um, you know, the, the event uh, world was hit really hard during COVID and baseball was not spared. Um, we essentially didn't have a season. So, so at the, the very base level, it does, it will provide a new revenue stream for us, but more importantly, it provides us, the Diamondbacks and the other teams an opportunity to, to enhance the experience for our fans. Long before 2018, when sports betting was made legal, people have been wanting this and we've been hearing that they want it. Uh, we certainly know that people are doing it, whether or not it's legal. Um, and we hear all the time that as soon as it became legal, we were hearing even more. We want it in Arizona, we want to be able to do it um, with the Diamondbacks, and, and I know I can speak for my counterparts at the other teams and the other sports that they were hearing it too. So fan experience is, is our priority. It's always been, and this just gives us an opportunity to enhance that fan experience. Uh, and, and it wasn't easy. I mean, there were a couple of things that each of our panelists have said that I, I clued in on specifically. Um, Ms. Rio saying that uh, people didn't want to hear from lobbyists. <laughs> 100% true. Um, and then Mr. Winnegar saying, you know, everybody worked so well together. It was interesting to me knowing that people didn't want to hear from lobbyists, um, how many of them there were <laughs> involved in this process. Um, when you say everybody, Mr. Winnegar, you definitely met everybody uh, down there. Um, but that, that was certainly a challenge uh, having recently been staffed it was a, a personal challenge for me when I had members who I considered to be friends saying, I don't wanna to talk to you. Um, I don't wanna hear it. Um, but eventually coming, coming around after hearing from leaders like Governor Lewis and, and other tribal leaders. And, and I will say that for the Diamondbacks specifically, it was a, an extra special day for us to stand next to folks that we already partner with so much uh, on one more big thing. And, and Governor Lewis, we've said it a million times together and separately how much we love working with the Gila River Indian community. And this was no different. And any, any new opportunity for that, we really look forward to. So it was a learning experience. It was historic for us. It will be great for our business um, and fantastic for our fans. Thank you, Amy Lynn. Now, Annie, I, I know how you felt that day because we shared a hug of, of exhaustion, I think, um, there at the Heard Museum. So I'm going to, you'll, I let you, I'll let you share a little bit about how you felt if you'd like, but I wanna ask you a slightly different question. And I wanna get into a little bit about the deal points. So we're negotiating this major compact um, with Arizona tribal nations and Arizona state government. And the Supreme Court comes down with a decision allowing states to take up sports betting. The state of Arizona and the tribes had never before agreed for non-tribal gaming or off-reservation gaming of any sort other than horse racing and a few uh, lottery and things like that. What happened to break through that barrier to create this compromise for the first time allowing for non-tribal gaming activities um, versus complete versus the previous understanding of what exclusivity meant. And Governor Lewis, I'm going to follow up with you uh, with a similar question. Annie? So thanks, Kirk. I would, first of all, I want to be really careful because um, what some people might not know is there was a non-disclosure agreement that was signed um, amongst the state and the tribes when we negotiated this, and we're still bound by that. So I, I want to be very careful about just saying that I'll present, you know, the state side and, and not talk about what um, information was exchanged by the tribes. But um, I, I think part of any negotiation 
is understanding what you're looking for and you have to have two willing parties at the table or however many parties it is that understand what their goals are as well. And so from the state's perspective, I think we did a really good job of laying out sort of our goals and they were broad goals, just like I mentioned in my presentation, it was modernization, it was increased revenue to the state. We didn't have specific, it has to be this. Right. Um, I will tell you that, you know, after the fact, we really did want um, sports betting in the state. Um, and but what that looked like, I don't think we had a specific idea at the beginning of the negotiation. As things moved forward, you know, we developed that a little bit more and we just understood what our goals were and communicated that with the tribes and said, these are the areas where we're willing to bend or move. Um, and these are the areas where we're not willing to bend or move. And uh, I mean, any good negotiation, um, that's, that's what you need to understand is, is what are your absolutes that you will not give up on and communicating that in a respectful way to the other parties. And that's how you find common ground. The other thing I, I will say, just to, in terms of that day at the Heard Museum, I still am not really sure that I, I fully appreciate what it was. I mean, there was so much work and this took so long that it, it was almost hard to sit back and really go, wow, we did it and celebrate that. And, um, you know, uh, just little things that I recollect in terms of, I remember the first time I brought up the idea of mobile anything in negotiations. Um, and for the, the listeners, you know, this was, this was way pre-COVID, right? We weren't talking about online things and it wasn't normal. And um, it, it was a, a really big deal. And we actually agreed to some of the, the mobile stuff and modernization before COVID ever hit. And I think we got to some of where we ended up with this negotiation because people saw um, what the impact of COVID was and how important that modernization was. So that's what I would share. Thank you, Annie. Now, Governor Lewis, um, I wanna ask you a question as well about some of those negotiations. Um, and then I wanna have sort of a political question for our two state legislators. Governor Lewis, every complex negotiation has big obstacles. And every complex negotiation has those moments where you think it's never going to happen, right? There's too much acrimony or disagreement or the sides are too far apart. There were two big issues. I'll call them principal issues in those negotiations that were very difficult. One was this concept of exclusivity, meaning complete, complete gaming exclusivity for Arizona tribal nations. And the other um, obstacle I want to point out is the, the differences uh, in the needs of metro tribes and rural tribes. And I wonder if you could sort of address for us um, how from a tribal leader perspective, we were able to overcome the traditional understanding or acceptance of exclusivity and talk also a little bit about this interplay between metro tribes, as we call them, and rural tribes, and how that was able to have been overcome. Uh, thank you for that, Kirk. And and you know, I come from a family of attorneys, so when we talk about those non-disclosure agreements, I, I'm that, that just shows how great Miss Foster is. <laughs> and and I, I've, I've always, you know, it's always good. You know, sometimes attorneys are a hindrance, but sometimes attorneys are there. You know, and 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 they and they also provide a very important. Uh, a resource. So, so thank you for that. But I think it's important, uh, really, uh, that that there is there was an important distinction between those rural tribes and and the urban tribes as well. You know, there there and, and, and really, you know, th th this was played out in, in, in the media. Um, you know, having to do with you know there were there were you know still trust issues uh, in regards to the Glendale Casino, uh, in regards to what constitutes. Uh, the Maricopa County market 
as well. And so those were very relevant issues uh, that were being discussed in, in regards to, uh, you know, the, the market that, of course, as you know, the Auction Indian community, of course, the Gila River Indian community, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, the Fort McDowell. Uh, and, and of course, you know, the, the Maricopa County, that, that whole market is the largest market for Arizona. And we understand that. Um, one of the things, and this is borrowing from my father's wisdom, was that first day uh, that we started our negotiations was that this compact had to serve all of the tribes. No tribes should be left behind in this. Uh, and, and, and that was a very ambitious statement that I made on behalf of the, the community. But I, I think to keep that solidarity with the tribes, which sort of ebbed and flowed over five years, um, you know, we had to look at very innovative ways. Uh, we looked at actually developing a fund to offset some of, of the uh, potential, um, I, I would say, the, 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 the new parts of the compact uh, that a fund would actually help to address for the rural market tribes outside of of, of both uh, the Tucson, uh, uh, Pima counties, and the uh, and the Maricopa counties, um, you know, and, and how and, and how that fund would work, how it would be constituted, how who would contribute, you know, that was also, you know, uh, very you know very uh, an engaging discussion from tribes. But we but we worked through that, uh, you know. So we tried to address we tried to address the, the non gaming tribes as well. Uh, you know, we continued uh, providing uh, resources in the form of, of uh, machine transfer agreements for those non-gaming tribes as well. So, you know, the non-gaming tribes, the rural market tribes, and those, the, those, those urban market tribes were all served, I believe, in the end, by this compact. And, and, and I want to say as well, this really, uh, when we talk about negotiations, when we talk about high-level complex, complex negotiations, as you said, uh, Kirk. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, we look at different leverage points, but I think what, what the tribes, and I know from my fellow tribes, uh, tribal leaders, we had teams, both from a policy, regulatory, uh, gaming, we, we had to definitely bring our A game. You know, we, we had our own experts, uh, our own uh, subject matter uh, experts in regards to gaming, in regards to to uh, the marketing analysis, uh, very sophisticated that we deployed to make sure you know that that uh, not just tribes collectively, but the individual tribes that we were all served by that. We had to do our we had to do our due diligence, um, and, and and I was just uh, of course you know I, we we uh, for, from the from the community uh, you know we we developed that internally, but you know as as a fellow tribal leader to see. Um, all of the tribes develop their own very sophisticated teams in this in, in this uh, very complex negotiation. I, I was, you know, I, I'm uh, I'm definitely yeah. um, uh, was 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 was, uh, uh, was was just you know it it it, it really it, it really showed that uh, you know that the, the the tribes definitely made the most out of their seat in the table. Kirk. Yeah, Governor Lewis, I can certainly vouch for that as well, and. Uh, the A game that the tribal nations brought required us on the state side of the table to do the same. So um, all were well represented and I think that shows in the final product. So I wanna go to our two state legislators real briefly um, and ask you both this question. Um, and we wanna make sure we leave a little bit more time as well for questions from the audience. So audience members, if you have those questions, please post them now in the Q and A. But before we get to them, I wanna ask Senator Rios and Representative Winnegar, we both, we all know that um, it's hard to separate politics from policy, right? Um, as hard as we try sometimes to do that, it, it will happen. And in this case, not everybody was thrilled about any kind of expansion of gaming in the state of Arizona. And so um, the question I wanna ask for both of you is the concerns of, that were raised by those who oppose the legislation or who oppose the expansion in the compact. 
how did you address those issues with specificity possible? And if you were able to address those concerns, how did you handle it? And I think we'll start first with Representative Winnegar and then Senator Rios have you close with the answers. Jeff? Thank you. Um, so I, I guess I'll get specific. You had two different parts. You had the Republicans and you had Democrats and they both had different objections. So on, on the Republican side, it was more of, they didn't think that outside the tribal communities, uh, they were getting enough. Now, when I say they, I mean, we had really good vote counts. I think 48 to 12 in the House. I think we only had six people vote against it in the Senate. So this is a small group, but mainly I, I address that with, you know, uh, I, I felt it was fair. We're getting something new. We're getting the sports betting inside and outside. It's gonna be great for both. Um, and, and most people got the economic development part of that and, and you know, growing the economy. On the other side, uh, again, it was a very small minority, but it, 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 it really came through as this, uh, well, we don't think they're getting, uh, the tribal nations are getting a good enough deal and we need to, uh, uh, to look it over and this and that. And I was very blunt that I thought that was insulting and, and I didn't want to hear any of that. Um, and I, I think that was a very small minority, but I, I, I have found it offensive. Um, yeah. And so that basically, you know, we worked through it, but it, it was a lot of, they were getting lobbied. You know, there was another faction of one track who didn't like, uh, thought that they should get more and more. And we know how that that all went. What's interesting is that now they're all, I was saying all along, I was like, well, we, we have in here, it's kind of, it's, it's not a lot of people know about it, but you can, you can bet, you know, through devices and online uh, on horse races now, not just calling up through a telephone. And they acted like they didn't like these things, but now they're all embracing them. So uh, uh, that's kind of interesting. Real quick before I go and, and I'll wrap my part up. Uh, there's a lot of thanks to go around and I'm just seeing two people on the line here that should be thanked along with a lot of other staff members and that's uh, Leanne Timoney and, uh, and uh, Lindsay Goodwin, my, my rock at the legislature. Without uh, all the people who really do a, a lion's share of the work, uh, uh, this wouldn't have happened. Thank you, Jeff, and thanks for pointing that out. Senator Rios, um, I remember um, the night this was passing in the state Senate, there was some very acrimonious language that was used. Um, and, you know, some of that was directed at you um, because you really did uh, put your shoulder to the wheel to get this done in your caucus. Um, tell me a little bit about how you uh, dealt with those who had very strong disagreements. Um, if you were able to address their concerns, what you did, and if you weren't able to, how you handled that. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think, you know, just starting out, I think it's fair to say that everybody in the caucus um, was there with their communities, their district best interest in mind. They weren't being obstructionist simply to be obstructionist. Um, I think what you had on the Democrat side were Democrats that were saying, wait a minute, why are, you know, all these sports teams getting all of this revenue? And does that not in fact hurt, you know, gaming revenues? Um, so that was one concern they had. The other concern they had was um, a, a, the exclusivity issue. And now you're going to have more gaming off reservation. C coupled with that, I think was very unique for me was it was not just some members of the caucus, but initially it was all of my Native American members of the caucus. So again, very, very um, difficult to navigate because on the one hand, we're trying very hard um, to do, you know, to honor the five years of negotiation between the governor and the tribes and deliver, but yet we had Native American members, again, with their best interests at heart, wanting to ensure that their communities were gonna be made whole. And you would have lobbyists after lobbyists coming in because they employed every lobbyist. <laughs> I mean, it was a moneymaker for lobbyists. And yet the irony was um, the tribal leaders ended up doing all the work with the Democratic caucus. <laughs> we had them on multiple meetings, Zoom meetings, phone calls, because at the end of the day, it was a matter, I think, of 
my caucus members trusting the message and the messenger, and it had to come directly from tribal leaders. And, and Governor Lewis, again, to his credit, had he not been willing to lead those meetings, I don't know that we would have gotten there. And although the final tally was six votes in opposition, and only one of those was a Democrat, it had started much larger and it took a while to get there. Um, I, I think also inherent in any political situation, you have egos with all legislators, right? Well, why wasn't I involved all along? And, and really trying to impart upon them, this isn't about us. This was a negotiation between tribes and the governor. And then lastly, you always have uh, legislators that wanna take, um, take advantage of the opportunity to play politics. Um, they could do a head count and say, oh, there's a lot of Republicans that don't like this. If we you know, side with them, maybe we can extract something. And really having to impress upon them this is not the issue upon which to do that. So it was a group effort. And I think at the end of the day, hearing directly from the tribes, as well as the governor's office, really being willing to sit and listen and answer any and every question that our members have, ultimately got all of the Democrats on board, with the exception of one. And, and, and so overall, I, you know, everybody got there, but it was not without a huge group effort. Absolutely. Thank you for that. We'd like to move now into some Q&A from the audience. Um, we have roughly 20 minutes or so for this, and so you want to get to as many questions as possible. So I'll ask the panelists to do your best um, to provide concise answers um, so we can get through as many as we can. But I want to start first with Mike Braun from Legislative Council. Annie, I'm going to direct this question towards you. Mike asks, is there any practical continuing import to the poison pill provision, given that all major types of gaming are now permitted? Annie? So the answer to that is, is yes, there is still a practical import because the poison pill provision is not just tied to additional gaming, it's tied to any kind of changes um, in the compact. And so, as the provision stands now in the amended compact, um, from the state's perspective, the interest is making sure that the number of devices and the number of casinos remains limited so that we don't end up with casinos on every corner. Um, and, and from the tribal perspective is that if the state chooses to, you know, make changes, um, we're still going to have to look to, you know, how that complies with the compact um, to any kind of legislation. So the, the compact and the legislation, you know, specifically the 2021 Gaming Act, they work together. Um, and so any changes to that gaming act is, is going to impact the compact and vice versa um, along those lines. So, so yes, there is a, a still a practical um, impact there. Great. Thank you, Annie. Next question is from Will Barno. His question is, is there a belief that Arizona will capture big dollar gamblers from other states or abroad as part of this new compact? If so, what is the impact of that? Governor Lewis, I wonder if you could weigh in on this with table games and increased bets limit, increased betting limits. Do you think there's an opportunity to, for our uh, tribal casinos to capture these big dollar gamblers? Yes, uh, great question. You know, and I think we already are. We've already implemented uh, roulette, uh, craps, uh, uh, the um, new table games that were a part of, you know, I think it was important, you know, that were a part of uh, the exclusivity goals uh, that, that are in the, the, the new compact uh, that are going to be protected for the next 26 years. Um, so we have games like Baccarat, Mini Bac, you know, which, which really, and, and with, with those, those, uh, those limits uh, that are set, you know, just significantly higher uh, along with sports betting, uh, you know, we, we already are seeing, uh, you know, just significant interest uh, in our client base and growing our client base as well. So, uh, and of course, in, in, uh, in September, you know, we're going to be working uh, with, with operationalizing our sports betting for the community. Uh, you know, we're very lucky to, uh, very fortunate um, uh, to be able to have a tri tripart deal with the Arizona Cardinals 
as well as BetMGM, one of the leaders in sports betting as well. So we have, we, we like to say we have three, three giants uh, in, 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 in each of these different areas uh, coming together. And I think that's sort of a model of how we saw this, uh, uh, the, the, the compact and, and, and the sports betting legislation uh, to work. Uh, so, so we're very excited. Great. Uh, Jeff, I wonder if you would also weigh in on this, you know, with um, the increased betting limits, how you think this will affect sort of the big poker players or the other industry that you're more familiar with. You're on mute though. Dude. There you go. Now we I got definitely you. think, I definitely think it will affect it. I mean, literally uh, a couple guys I know who won some world series of poker bracelets said one of the big reasons is these side games that, that they can't have after they get knocked out of a tournament. So I, I really think it, it, it's an invitation uh, uh, for the, uh, the great casino poker rooms to, you know, hopefully start staging and, and with a partnership like the governor just said, those are easier facilitated because they have those relationships in other places already as well. And so I think uh, you could see that whether or not, you know, you have professional blackjack players and stuff, I don't know, but I definitely think the, the poker part uh, could, could be a magnet. Great. Thank you. From Andy Kavasic, um, I want to um, address this one to Amy Lynn. Was there any concern about the risk that sports wagering could tamper with the integrity of the actual sporting events? And Annie Foster, I, I might ask you to weigh in on this as well. Amy, Amy Lynn? Sure, there was absolutely um, concern about that and not, not just from the legislative level or, um, but from the league level. And, and I had lots of conversations with MLB um, and we had, coalition conversations with other leagues as well, where we discussed the things that would need to be in place specifically for us to be able to participate. So Arizona making it legal to have sports betting wasn't enough for the Arizona Diamondbacks to, to be able to participate. If there hadn't been certain things in place in statute and then as a part of the rulemaking process, we wouldn't have been able to participate because our league wouldn't have allowed it. So certainly there were a lot of uh, uh, guardrails put in place in statute and in rule that were 100% just about the integrity of the game. And that is certainly a, a huge concern of ours. I will say though that when there have been sports betting controversies, I will call them in the past, and it, it has been legal sports betting operators that have found them. They know how betting works. They know how odds works. They know how these things work so well that when somebody starts to, to mess with it, they spot it instantly. And so to legalize it and to bring the folks who are already gambling on sports illegally now to a legal venue, it's much more easily controlled. But absolutely, it, it was a concern. It was a concern that was addressed. The governor's office um, certainly worked with us on all of that. It was a concern from their end too, as far as we could tell, because they care about the integrity of the game. Um, and, and we are confident that, that we did address that in the legislation. Right. Annie, we um, on the state side also had this concern and we, I know you and I together looked across the country for a best in class language around these integrity provisions. Talk a little bit about um, the state's approach to maintaining integrity in sports? So uh, what I would say is in, in terms of maintaining integrity and, and making sure, first of all, if, if fans don't believe that, um, you know, the, the games that they're watching are, um, you know, being played, you know, appropriately and that people are throwing them in some senses or profiting from them based on their performance, um, that's going to be a problem, not just from the fan perspective, but from the ability to operate a sports 
betting, you know, industry. And so from that perspective, um, it, it was a huge concern of ours. Um, we haven't talked and we don't have anybody here, um, you know, representing the colleges and universities, but that was a huge issue in terms of, you know, how we addressed, um, you know, sports betting in re regards to colleges and universities. Um, and we looked at that very carefully. We looked across the country uh, to uh, find out what was happening. Um, we listened to the colleges and universities about their concerns. And, and what we found across the nation on that issue was that uh, there, there were states who had done both, states who had allowed for sports betting against um, on college uh, sports and states that hadn't. But what we saw over time is that some of those states who had not allowed for it exactly for the same reasons Amy Lynn mentioned, um, they actually began allowing for it because that was the way to catch any kind of bad behavior that was happening is you have checks and balances in place. That's the whole role of Department of Gaming going forward on sports betting is, is they are going to be regulating this. There are obligations for the teams and those operating sports books to report to the Department of Gaming if they become aware of any kind of um, suspicious activity. Um, so there are a lot of checks and balances that are in place, but if you don't have integrity in the system on both sides, then you're not going to have a, a successful industry on sports betting and our professional sports industry as well. Um, so it, it was a huge concern of ours, but we also wanted to make sure that we didn't limit it too much going forward because when you're starting a brand new industry I mean that's what we're talking about here is that's what this endeavor was is is a brand new industry on a sports betting event wagering we don't know what it's going to look like so we needed some flexibility there and that's where the Department of Gaming comes in with their regulations because they're able to change those regulations um, if you know they they find out that there's some issue that we hadn't thought of you know, they, they can issue regulations to address some of those concerns. Um, so going forward, uh, we do have those checks and balances in place. Great. Thank you, Annie. Now, our last question comes from Stacy Tucker. And I want to open up to the group and chime in as, as you feel it. She asks, what's the biggest lesson you learned from this experience? And what advice do you have for those looking to collaborate on projects in the future? What's the biggest lesson you learned from this experience? And what advice do you have for those who hope to collaborate on big projects like this in the future? Senator Rios? I'll jump in. Um, don't make assumptions. And, and I, I learned that personally, but I think also some of the lobbying community and others made assumptions that Democrats were just gonna be there. And I think the other issue is to the extent possible when you're dealing with legislators, <laughs> engage them again, to the extent possible, as early as possible, you're dealing with political egos. It's the reality. Right, right, excellent. Anybody else, biggest lesson you learned and what advice you'd give? Yeah, I'll jump in real quick. Um, it's a good question. I mean, the thing is though, is it reiterates, I think lessons that Senator Rios and I have learned because we're we are ones that work with both sides of the aisle and try to uh, get things done. I, um, so I, I guess I would just encourage that more. Now, obviously, there's hot button issues that's not going to work on, but building a coalition of both sides and trying to um, spread the credit and the help with both sides because they are both engaging and uh, both sides are getting across the finish line as well as all the other groups. Um, so I, I think that's real important. I think good things can be done. And there's a, a, a great group of, on both sides of the aisle, people who do that regularly. It's just not a sexy topic for as much as the media says that they want it. A lot of times they don't report on it when it does happen. Governor Lewis. Uh, we, we spoke earlier, this was a complex negotiation um, and probably nobody uh, uh, lived that more than you did um, as you dealt with not only the negotiation with the tribal nations and the state, but the intra-tribal negotiations as well. 
Um, we achieved success. We got across the finish line. It was a big historic deal. What advice would you give to those that may be looking to collaborate on big projects like this in the future? Well, you know, two things come, come to mind, Kirk. First, patience. That, that jumps out when, 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 I, when I've heard this question. Uh, trust, but verify is another, is another that, that would be from, from uh, you know, probably channeling my, my, my late father, Rod, Rod Lewis. But I think, you know, looking in retrospect, you know, I, from, from what I've seen, um, really, firsthand, was everyone having the best intentions, you know, moving, looking at the whole process, five years. Um, and, and, you know, for, for me as, as, as governor of, of the Gila Urban Community, how uh, gaming is, was so, it's critical to, to our community um, to, to see the, the negotiations continue through a worldwide pandemic. In fact, things came together um, in, in such sort of historic fashion. Um, you know, I, I, I think, I think what, what we saw was true coalition building. Um, and, 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 and really, when, when I talk about my fellow tribal leaders, um, you know, we have a lot of unsung heroes too. A lot of staff members, uh, as as was as was sort of alluded to, you know that that uh, really it, it couldn't have been done without them as well. Um, you know, of course, you know there, there there's going to be politics, um, but I think if you keep really um, from a public policy perspective, what is you know what what, what are the aims and goals of public policy? I think I saw that in our many discussions, both on the Republican side. Uh, with with uh, leader Rios as well, you know, uh, I, I know that we we've had to have, and, and she she also intimated that as well, you know, just some heart to heart uh, discussions as well. But um, you know, I think those lines of communication came open, and, and, and you know, especially during, um, you know, when we had to meet a lot of, of, of very important meetings virtually as well. I mean, a lot of complicating factors, but I think as as all of us you know, our, our, our Arizonans, proud Arizonans, you know, we saw, you know, uh, this being so significant to, to the state, uh, to the economy, uh, to the, 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 the well-being uh, of, of, of everyone involved, you know, I think, you know, I think we, we, we I think that really elevated everyone's game. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you, Governor. And I'll add something uh, to, to answer this question about advice that could be given over a situation like this. I don't think I will ever forget uh, the first time almost five years ago, we gathered all the tribal leaders on the second floor of the executive tower and the meeting did not go very well. And I remember leaving the meeting and turning to uh, the rest of the governor's team and saying, we're not gonna get anywhere until they trust us. And we had to build that trust and trust is not something particularly with the history of our tribal communities and the state and the federal government, that's not something you can quickly build. And so we decided that we had to overtly demonstrate that we were trustworthy. So we hit the road and we visited them in their communities. I remember taking a helicopter to see the Wallapai tribe. I remember uh, getting in the car and, and driving to our small rural tribes. I remember meeting um, where the, meeting them where they were so that they knew that we were serious, they weren't going away. And in time, we were able to build the trust necessary to really negotiate in good faith with each other. And that's one of the takeaways or piece of advice that I would give is sometimes you have to put forth the effort to be trusted um, when there's conflict and difficult um, things to negotiate and work through. I wanna thank each of the panelists. I think there's been a lot of wisdom shared here today, and I hope the listeners have learned some great nuggets, not only about what's in the compact and the sports betting bill, but also the process of how to get something like this done. I also want you to know that what was accomplished this year through this gaming compact and event wage, wagering legislation has truly become a national model across the country. 
I'm sure each of the panelists on this phone have heard from other states and other interests across the country, just like I have. I remember I received a call from a state, uh, unnamed state um, in the uh, Northeast. And the question was, how do we get the Arizona deal here? How can we do this in our state? So it's become a national model, one that I hope Arizonans can be proud of, and one that I think will safely provide for this type of entertainment and the additional revenues that feed so many valuable uh, groups and organizations, and in particular, the benefit that this provides to our tribal nations and the people that they serve. So thank you to each of our panelists for your participation today. Thank you for the participants for joining us. We hope you learned a little bit and we hope that you have a great afternoon. Thank you everyone.